Good afternoon and welcome to NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. We've got a lot to cover today about the Mars Curiosity rover, including some new images and a special message. First, I'd like to introduce our panelists. We're going to hear from Dave Lavery, the program executive from Mars Science Laboratory, and he's from NASA headquarters in Washington. Mike Malin is the principal investigator of the Mass Camera, or MassCam, on Curiosity with Malin Space Science Systems in San Diego. John Grotzinger, Mars Science Laboratory Project Scientist with the California Institute of Technology in Pasadena. Paul Mahaffey is the principal investigator of the Sample Analysis at Mars, or SAM instrument, with Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. And we have Chad Edwards of JPL, Chief Telecommunications Engineer for NASA's Mars Exploration Program. We're going to start things off with Dave Lavery. Good afternoon. Um, we've got a special uh, piece of information to talk with you about today. Everyone's very familiar so far with the, the photos, the data, the spectra that have been returned from the Curiosity rover. We actually have a, have a new data type that uh, we're going to uh, let you hear about today that's a unique first of. One of the things that the rover has returned recently from the surface of Mars is actually a pair of audio files, and we're going to talk about the first one today. Um, this is a message from the NASA administrator that you're going to hear that was actually sent from the rover from the surface of the planet. Um, it fulfills a couple of different purposes. This is an appropriate, first off, an appropriate thank you and recognition from the administrator to the team that put Curiosity on the surface. Um, in addition, it also fulfilled a purpose in helping us exercise some of the new adaptive communications capabilities that Curiosity has in terms of transmitting information back from the planet and getting information to the planet. You're going to hear some more about that from Chad in just a few minutes. Uh, but perhaps most of all, it was actually a, an opportunity to understand that we could have a voice, a human voice, sent back from the surface of another planet for the very first time in history. Um, with this, we have another small step that's being taken in extending the human presence beyond Earth and actually experience, bring that experience of exploring the planets back a little bit closer to all of us and actually extending that human touch. As Curiosity continues her mission, we hope that the words of the administrator will be an inspiration to someone who is alive today who will become the first to stand upon the surface of the planet Mars. Like the great Neil Armstrong, they'll be able to speak aloud in first person at that point of the next giant leap in human exploration. So if we could have the video, piece. Hello, this is Charlie Bolden, NASA Administrator, speaking to you via the broadcast capabilities of the Curiosity rover, which is now on the surface of Mars. Since the beginning of time, humankind's curiosity has led us to constantly seek new life, new possibilities just beyond the horizon. I want to congratulate the men and women of our NASA family, as well as our commercial and government partners around the world for taking us a step beyond to Mars. This is an extraordinary achievement. Landing a rover on Mars is not easy. Others have tried. Only America has fully succeeded. The investment we are making, the knowledge we hope to gain from our observation and analysis of Gale Crater, will tell us much about the possibility of life on Mars, as well as the past and future possibilities of our own planet. Curiosity will bring benefits to Earth and inspire a new generation of scientists and explorers as it prepares the way for a human mission in the not-too-distant future. Thank you. And with that, we have the first human voice from another planet. Mike? Thank you. If I can have the video, please. This is uh, going to be a, a pan through and zoom into the uh, full resolution uh, mass cam 34, the medium resolution camera view of Mars. Uh, this uh, mosaic has been released a couple of times going through. Uh, we filled on all the holes. We've added uh, Mount Sharp in the system in the in the sequence. This is uh, basically 140 M34 images. Uh, the mosaic is about 29,000 pixels wide by 7,000 pixels tall. Uh, the colors in this are modified from the original as returned. As returned, it's a little more khaki looking. Uh, we basically do processing to brighten up the scene and to adjust some of the colors. 
As you can see, the layering in Mount Sharp, uh, John's going to talk about that in a few minutes. The, uh, this pan is going to end at a location where I'll pick up with some stills in a minute. Uh, basically, this mosaic was out of focus. We didn't have the, character, the focus positions characterized well enough when we landed to ensure that the images would be in focus when we took this sequence. We've been in the midst of a, a characterization phase for the last week or so, gotten uh, several hundred images, uh, and these images are going to be returned to the Earth over a longer period of time in a, in a raw form that allows us to do a bunch of tests with them uh, once we get them back on the ground. If I can have the first uh, slide, this is basically the same area you were looking at in the last uh, portion of the video. Uh, just a word about the colors. This has been white balanced, uh, but with a little less blue than normally comes in with white balance. I do this because it looks pretty to me, and it's also a geologically interpretable image. Since my experience is on the Earth, I like to look at things as they would look like on the Earth. And on Mars, it's, as I said, a little more khaki color, a little bit, also a little pink on top of that. In the foreground, you see the, the gravel lag that the rover is sitting on. Between us and that uh, middle section, which is a, a, a rim of an impact crater, uh, there's actually a little depression between us. And as you'll see in, in a few slides farther on, I've got some of the distances labeled. And then farther out, you see the, the darker sand dunes. Uh, there's actually, in that foreground view, a, uh, a sort of little orange-brown ripple, which is a sand of a different composition than the far middle sand in the, in the, in the darker area there. Uh, the next slide shows a, a box that's just going to, I'm going to bring up that area in the, in the M100. The next uh, slide shows the left side of this image is the M34 zoomed up by a factor of three uh, because there's a factor of three difference in the resolutions of the two cameras. On the right hand side is the M100, the 100 millimeter focal length camera. And uh, again, at, at, at these types of scales, where you're looking at sort of a, a, an average down view as is, is shown in television, uh, it's very hard to see the improvement in the resolution. But towards the end, I'll show you one thing where, where I think it, the, the quality of what we're getting from the, uh, from the higher resolution camera will come through. The next view shows that single uh, high resolution. This is actually two merged uh, narrow angle or um, M100 images. Uh, and uh, we took a whole sequence of these from looking basically from the rover's wheels all the way out to the horizon, running through the entire focus range of the cameras. And we've characterized in great detail now where the best focus at each distance is. And, uh, and these are in, in much better focus. And uh, you'll see in a minute the, uh, the quality at, when you zoom it up. Next slide will show the distances. So there's a gravel in the foreground out to about 100, 125 meters. Then there's a little swale, which is a depression, from there out to the rim of an impact crater. Uh, so there's a, there's a depression between us and the rim of the impact crater. And that's, that depression goes from about 125 to 230 meters. And then those rocks are at 230 meters, and uh, they're about uh, a meter across, something like that. Uh, You'll see a slightly lighter area just below the 3.7 off to the left. That's the other rim of the, of the crater. That's the far rim of the crater. That's only about another 20 meters or 30 meters away. Uh, between there and uh, the 3.7 kilometers at the base uh, of the, or in the middle of this image, which is on the dune field, the dark dune field, there's a depression that, that is found completely around uh, Mount Sharp. There's a, a moat, a deeper area. We don't actually start seeing it until it's about three kilometers away. And then you can see mounds at dis a variety of distances. At the very top uh, of this uh, slide, we're looking 16.2 kilometers away. You're looking through some haze, which is why it gets a little brighter as you go to the top of the image. The next slide is going to be my last. This is an enlargement of that last, of that last slide. And uh, it's very geologically exciting to me, and it's also very pretty. Um, it's probably a little bit more pastel and a little bit uh, pinker than it would be to your eye, but it, it's to me very 
geologically interpretable, and there's a lot of neat stuff in there that I see. So there's a, you sort of see a, from the middle right side of the image going up to the, towards the top, there's sort of a diagonal layer. That's actually a layer of material that's draping over previous existing topography, and that whole stuff was then buried and, he, and exhumed and eroded to give you what you see now. Last thing, the last slide is for reference. In the, in the box of the main image, uh, which is about uh, 30 meters across, there's a little black dot. That little black dot is a boulder the size of the rover. And so I've enlarged it in the lower right there so you can see it. But that gives you an idea of the scale of these hills and the canyons that we'll be driving on. Basically, this is the ultimate goal. This is where we want to get in the next year and a half or two years. This is the place we want to be. It's, uh, this is 10 kilometers away. And it would take the rover, even if the rover were driving flat out, uh, 100 days to get there. And we're not going to drive flat out because we have science to do as well. So it's going to take us a while to get over there. But uh, basically, when we're there, if we had left the camera at the landing site, we'd set, see this and it look, you know, maybe we'll get up to that boulder and we can actually uh, see what it looks like. John? Yeah. Thanks, Mike. I, I think, uh, Henry, if you could just put that one back up again, I, I think when uh, those of us on the science team looked at that image for the first time, you, you get this feeling, you know, that's what I'm talking about. That, <laughs> that is why we picked this landing site. And although this, the anticipated scenic beauty was not something that was at the top of the list for reasons to select it, it was certainly one thing that we were hoping would come through one day. So it's, it's awesome to, to see this. And I think when you look down from orbit and, and you get a sense for what you're looking at on the ground, you don't really know what it's going to look like until you're on the ground and then, and then you see it. The really amazing thing about this is all those layers that you're looking at are the layers from orbit that contain the hydrated uh, phyllosilicates and sulfates. So everything in that image uh, there is a science target for us. And, and again, the, the goal here is to drive up eventually, and, and Mike's right, it'll probably take us a year to get there, but when we do, uh, there's a very systematic approach to exploring, moving around through this terrain that looks like it, it was something that comes out of a John Ford movie. Uh, you know, we're going to be driving the rover around in these valleys and looking up at these hills and finding the places where the strata come down and intersect the topography that the rover can, can drive through. And we know it can because there's so much great data from orbit that allowed us to simulate the drives before we chose this landing site to demonstrate that we could make it up through, through this terrain. But as the images came down, there was uh, another feature that really caught our attention. So if we can go to the head to the next one, what, what you see in this, in this image, uh, in the mosaic that Mike put together, is there's a, a, a train of white dots that we placed there to indicate a transition from the strata that are uh, almost flat-lying, not quite, uh, and they're full of the hydrated minerals, to strata above them, which do not obviously contain the hydrated minerals. Now, we don't know from orbit whether they're absent, those uh, spectral responses, because they're covered with dust or because they're truly absent. But the striking thing about it is that everything above that line of white dots is steeply inclined with respect to everything that's below it. They dip from left to right. And, and these are features that, that geologists call clinoforms. They, they indicate that in the accretion of the strata that they built out progressively from left to right in a relative sense. So this is a spectacular uh, um, feature that we're seeing very early on that you only had the slightest hint from orbit based on the orbiter data looking straight down. You really need to be down on the ground and looking at a cross section. Um, but th this kind of relationship is something that can help us understand uh, the origin of these strata that, that clearly are the result of the exhumation of, of, of the larger uh, sequence of strata that created Mount Sharp. So the, the Earth has lessons to teach us about situations like this. And if we go to the next one, we see the Grand Canyon, which we have always felt is a good uh, analog for Gale. This goes back to work that uh, Mike and Ken Edgett did uh, over a decade ago, where they appreciated the thickness of strata that were there based on looking at images from the mock camera. And they also anticipated that that contact with the white dots on it 
not this one, but the one from Gale, may be what a geologist calls an unconformity, where there was some profound change where you go from the lower layers to the upper layers. And here in the Grand Canyon, you have the same thing. All the layers beneath that, that train of white dots are inclined uh, from left to right, and everything above it is flat lying. And this is a very dramatic unconformity. It represents an, a, a record failure in Earth history of on the order of several hundred millions of years of time. Now, we don't have any way to, to do an, an analogous thing on, on Mars, but by looking at these geometric uh, discontinuities in, in, the, in the strata, we, we can sense that there is a big change uh, up Mount Sharp, and, and one day, uh, we hope, uh, towards the end of our mission to get up and go across that contact and check it out. And uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Paul to tell us about what Sam's found. Yeah, thanks very much, John. Um, I'm here really to tell you about uh, completion uh, of what's a real milestone for, for the SAM team, completing uh, an assessment of, of the health of SAM. Uh, curiosity, as you've gathered by now, is a, a very uh, complicated beast with lots of parts, and uh, the project's being very systematic about testing things out, and we're, we're trying to be patient and uh, wait our turn. And our turn uh, is coming now, uh, and in fact, we've completed uh, a series of tests that, that tell us how SAM's performing. Uh, why don't you bring up the first graphic? Before I go into the test, I'll tell you just a little bit, remind you a little bit about uh, SAM and what SAM does. Uh, those images are just spectacular, so MassCam is kind of the uh, eyes of curiosity and uh, we think of ourselves a little bit as a nose of curiosity and uh, we're, <laughs> we're getting ready to start sniffing. And we sniff both atmospheric gases and uh, gases that we drive off of solids. And the tests that we've uh, carried out up to this point, and the test I'm going to talk about in a little bit more detail is really the fourth test, have been designed to make sure that all these, these pieces are working. Uh, the first test we did was just kind of an aliveness test. We turned on for a few minutes, and Sam comes back with, Sam, I am, I am Sam. And uh, we know that we're talking to Sam, but it also gets data on all the sensors. Um, the next test really was to go through a much more comprehensive test. This was uh, some days ago where we turn on all the heaters and look at a temperature response. It's about an hour-long test. That was fine. Uh, the third thing we do is uh, what one part of SAM is this uh, electromechanical system where we process solid samples. We put a sample under the SSIT, the solid sample inlet tube that you see on the right uh, frame there, and it gets shaken, the sample goes down into a cup, we move the cup into an oven, we heat it up and we sniff those gases with, with multiple instruments. And uh, so what we did in the third test was uh, make sure that that system was working and it was working just fine. Uh, but we still hadn't turned on our pumps, uh, we hadn't turned on uh, two of the main instruments, the mass spectrometer and the tunable laser spectrometer. So that's what we did. Uh, we got the data Saturday morning at 5 a.m. Uh, and everything worked beautifully. So it was, it was really a big milestone uh, for the team. Uh, SAM is uh, uh, a combination, as I mentioned, of three instruments, but then it's glued together with this uh, set of transfer tubes that we heat up. Uh, the sample manipulation system that I mentioned and so on. So it's really a fairly uh, complicated device. We've had many dozens of, of talented engineers uh, all over the country, and in fact, uh, it's an international effort. Uh, the tunable laser spectrometer in, in SAM was developed right here at JPL uh, by Chris Webster's team. The gas chromatograph was developed in, in France uh, by uh, Michel Caban and his team. The mass spectrometer was developed at Goddard, and then all this, this uh, system was integrated uh, and tested uh, at Goddard. So uh, we also had engineers in, in many states kind of contributing remotely, uh, Michigan, Florida, Montana, red states, blue states, uh, all over the country. Um, and uh, so this really was an assessment of, of Sam's health. And let me talk a little bit about the test then. Uh, this test was designed to uh, take a brief sniff of Mars atmosphere and then put some of that gas in the mass spectrometer and some of it in the tunable laser spectrometer 
both to look for isotopes, heavy versus light, light elements in compounds, and to look at the major constituents of the gas. Uh, but it was primarily an engineering test, see if see if them's healthy and if the instruments work. Uh, the one little blip we had actually was that we had brought along a little bit more of uh, a combination of uh, earth atmosphere that had very slowly leaked into the TLS and um, a bit of calibration gas. And so when we tried to pump that out of the TLS, the, the pump current went up a little bit and did what it was supposed to do. It said, I'm not too happy with that current, and it shut itself down. But as a consequence of that, the very first sample, we did not measure Mars atmosphere. We measured Florida air and uh, our calibration gas, which was of quite less interest to the science team. But nevertheless, we had a really good exercise uh, looking at how the instrument uh, worked. Uh, so in summary, uh, the instruments work beautifully, the TLS and the uh, mass spectrometer. We still have to uh, wait for tests of the gas chromatograph. That'll come some souls down the road. And uh, we're looking forward in a few souls, really, to getting our first sniff of Mars atmosphere and uh, learning more about uh, the history of Mars, uh, what the atmosphere is telling us with regard to its isotopes and its composition, and then ultimately how that compares with gases that come out of rocks. So, uh, that might have been formed billions of years ago. So it's, it's really going to be fun. We're looking forward to getting in those layers that uh, John and Mike talked about. And with that, I'll hand it over to Chad, who's going to tell us about how the uh, data all comes down and gets processed. All right, thanks, Paul. Yeah, I'd like to share today a little bit of the story of how we bring the, the kinds of science data that you're hearing about today back to Earth. One of the challenges of a landed mission, even uh, for a rover the size of Curiosity, is the, the daunting job of, of transmitting data from the surface of Mars all the way back to Earth, which, which can be up to 400 million kilometers away. Um, and uh, a rover like Curiosity has a relatively limited capability to transmit on that direct to Earth path. Uh, it has a transmitter about 15 watts and an antenna about a foot in diameter. And uh, with that capability, trying to communicate straight back to Earth, we're limited to data rates on the order of about 1,000 bits per second. Uh, and that's just not adequate to bring back the kind of science products that, that we're looking at today. And so what we've done is take advantage of the, uh, the orbiting science satellites that we have uh, around Mars and use them as relay communications assets. And essentially we have a, a telecommunications network around Mars that's allowing us to bring that data back. Uh, if I could have the first chart, please. Uh, we have three orbiters at Mars today. Uh, the Odyssey spacecraft that was launched in 2001. Uh, ESA's Mars Express spacecraft that was launched in 2003, and uh, NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter launched in 2005. Uh, all three of these orbiters were positioned on landing day to collect signals from MSL as it landed during the seven minutes of terror of entry, descent, and landing. It was very important for us to capture that critical event telemetry, and uh, we took advantage of the unique capabilities of each of these orbiters to capture uh, information about the landing. Uh, since we've landed, we've typically been using our NASA orbiters, Odyssey and uh, MRO, to do the bulk of the data return. And uh, I'll show you in a, in a second a little bit about why their orbits are particularly well suited uh, for supporting the surface mission. Um, and, uh, but, but a very important aspect of our strategy is uh, that ESA's Mars Express spacecraft is available as a, an additional backup relay asset, and that's an important part of the robustness of our telecommunication plan. And we have had a successful opportunity already on SOL 13 to demonstrate that we can flow data through Mars Express uh, and back to Earth. Okay, if I could have the next chart, please, and this will give us a little bit of a view of what these orbits look like at Mars. You're seeing Odyssey and MRO, they're in orbits of about 300 to 400 kilometers, and you can see as MRO passes over the landing site, it establishes a link. These orbits are sped up. These uh, relay contacts last for about 10 to 15 minutes, typically. You can see the orbit planes are fixed in orientation in a polar orbit, and they're actually, our two orbiters are positioned MROs around 3 p.m. and 3 a.m. local time on Mars, and Odyssey's about three, uh, 4 p.m. and 4 a.m. And you're looking at the afternoon side of the planet here. So typically we have a relay opportunity with each of the orbiters in that afternoon uh, portion. You also saw the highly elliptical orbit of Mars Express uh, in that visualization. Now we're down on the surface, and this gives you a little bit of a view from, uh, uh, from Curiosity's perspective about what a relay pass looks like. On, in particular, on this link to Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, we have a new capability which we refer to as adaptive data rates, so that as that orbiter rises in the sky and the quality of the link improves, the two radios at each end of the link are able to exchange messages with each other and optimize uh, the, the data rate 
as a function of time over the past to constantly be using the maximum data rate that the communication channel can support at that point in time. It's the first time we've exercised that. Uh, over the weekend was the first time we, we had a chance to use that. It uh, performed fabulously. We set a record for the amount of data we were able to bring back on a single pass, even though that pass was not at a particularly high data rate or a particularly high elevation angle. Uh, and so that really bears out the strength of this adaptive data rate algorithm to be able to take advantage of the geometry of the pass, vary the data rate continuously as you fly across the sky and move uh, a large amount of data. Um, so just to conclude, if I could have the last chart, and this is sort of how we're doing to date. Um, we're looking at 20 SOLs here, and you're seeing a, a, a chart of the cumulative volume of data that we've returned from Curiosity via the two NASA orbiters. Again, we've only had one short uh, relay pass that we've conducted with Mars Express. That was very successful in terms of demonstrating our interoperability, uh, but uh, not a significant contributor to the total amount of data volume that we've brought back to date. Uh, and you can see that to date, we've already brought back uh, in excess of seven gigabits of data. Just by contrast, that's about a factor of two to three more than uh, we have brought back, we had brought back from Spirit, Opportunity, or Phoenix at that same point in the mission, 20 sols in. Uh, and that's really a, a tribute to the, particularly the new capabilities on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter spacecraft where we have what we call an electro radio on each of those uh, orbiters, on, on, on MRO as well as on MSL. Uh, it allows us to go to much higher data rates, instantaneous rates of up to two megabits per second, uh, and this adaptive data rate capability that allows us to bring a lot more data back. So uh, I think at this point, uh, I'll hand it back to Jane. Thank you very much, and we'll start our Q&A period for reporters. We do have some reporters who are calling in with questions today, but let's take a look and see if anybody here at JPL has a question. If you do, please raise your hand and wait for the mic to come to you and then state your name and your affiliation. First question, Emily. Emily Lochtewala from the Planetary Society. I have a question about the geology in the hills that you're looking at. The comparison that you made to the Grand Canyon showed a angular unconformity where the beds were angled, chopped off, and then you had flat-lying beds. I don't know if I've ever seen anything where the beds on top were inclined. So you, can you talk about the kind of environment that might have made that, that sort of um, bed form? Uh, it's, it's a really good question. Uh, the, the layers are tilted in the Grand Canyon because of plate tectonics here on Earth, so it's, it's typical to see older layers be more deformed and more rotated than the ones above them. In this case, you have flat-lying layers on Mars overlain by tilted layers, and um, you know the science team, of course, is deliberating over what this means. But in the absence of plate tectonics, I, I think you're you're really kind of pretty much looking at some kind of a mechanism that relates back to the physical environment in which the strata accumulated. And and uh, you know we we don't have too much more insight into that right now. But uh, it it does require a, a, a flux of material, presumably from left to right, in that image that you're seeing there. So some, it somehow relates to the depositional mechanics, we would guess. Yeah. And if I could just ask another quick question of Mike. First of all, that picture was stunning. So <laughs> congratulations on the performance of your camera. Um, the, the mosaic is really, really beautiful, but there's one missing part to it, the rover at the bottom. And I'm wondering if you're planning on taking a mosaic that will include um, the rover in color as well. Not likely. I, I, it's not part of our requirements, so I... It's, it's bits you have to bring back and it's planning you have to put into it. I'm not sure exactly how many more mosaics we're going to end up getting once we release the camera to the science team. They're going to want to go shoot lots of special purpose targets, I think. Thanks. Okay, do we have any more questions here at JPL? If so, please raise your hand. All right, why don't we jump to the phones now? We have a question. Let's take a question from Irene Klotz at Reuters. Hello, Irene. Hi, thanks very much. I, I actually have a couple questions. Um, the first probably for Chad regarding that, um, the relay broadcast of uh, Charlie Bolden's voice. Could you just explain if this was some technical accomplishment or could this have been done before with, uh, with, with other rovers if, if someone had thought or had wanted to do it? I guess I just really didn't understand beyond kind of the PR value, what it is that you were demonstrating. Okay, uh, my understanding is that the, the volume of data uh, in that audio file is on the order of about four megabits. That's uh, certainly something that, a capability we could have uh, ex uh, executed in the past on prior missions. I think the, uh, the growth in our data uh, 
transmission capabilities on this mission allows us to, to do this while also not sacrificing any of our uh, uh, science bandwidth. So uh, yeah, th that would be my, my, my thoughts on that. Okay, um, thanks very much. And uh, for John, um, I just wanted to follow up a little bit more about the uh, the angles um, that that were demonstrated in that in that picture. Um, do you do you have some uh, measurement of the of the non conformity? In other words, what's the angle of the top layers compared to the flat ones? And is there anything um, on Earth that forms things like that aside from the plate tectonics that you've already discussed? Uh, yeah, we will eventually get to to uh, to measuring those those angles. Uh, Mike has been working on sequences to execute that give us uh, long baseline stereo, and then from that we should be able to actually quantitatively determine the angles up there. Um, again, you know, on Earth there are a whole host of of mechanisms that can generate inclined strata that have only to do with the depositional mechanics of, of the process itself. If, for example, uh, you took a cross-section through a volcano, all the layers would be dipping at a steep angle that would be corresponding to the surface of the volcano if it's volcanic material. Uh, you, you could imagine other situations where uh, sediment gets dumped down at, at an angle and uh, that are subaqueous in origin. Uh, the wind does that every time it makes a sand dune. You have uh, strata that, that dip at the angle of the front of the sand dune. So, you know, the cool thing here is just that the cameras have discovered something that we were completely ignorant of uh, prior to that. It's, it's a non-unique interpretation. It's going to take the science team a lot of work to get at it, and probably we're going to have to drive up there to, to see what those strata are made out of. But a lot of people ask the question: Are there are there big surprises uh, that that when you've since you've landed that you see, and and so far it's kind of looked like terrains that we're familiar with and things like that. And this this thing just kind of jumped out as, at us as being something very different from what we ever expected. Thank you. Okay, John. I understand we have something that has just come in. Um, a picture that we wanted to share oh, with great. our audience. Uh, so though we just had, this is late breaking news uh, that just came in down from Mars in the last hour and it shows the tracks of our most recent drive. And this was now, this is the result of the first drive that was commanded explicitly for the purpose of science. And it positions the rover directly over the most prominent of the scour marks that was created by thruster impingement during EDL. So if you go all the way back to the time when we first landed, uh, I made the comment about how we've, we've basically blown away all the surface materials and we get kind of a freebie sample. Uh, well, now we're sampling it uh, with the DAN instrument, which is the neutron generator, and that will acquire uh, data over this bare rock to compare with uh, measurements that were made where the soil uh, cover existed. And, uh, and the science team has also planned uh, observations with the ChemCam instrument on that scour mark as well. So we're, we're going to be uh, collecting quite a broad uh, range of measurements over this, this feature uh, before, uh, in a few days' time, we, we drive away uh, to the east towards Glen Elg. Thank you, John. It's always fun to have breaking news in a live news conference. Let's take a question from the phone. Uh, Leo Enright with Irish TV. Thanks, Jane. Um, uh, just looking at that picture, uh, it's obvious you can see the wheel tracks almost like footprints. Uh, and I think for the uh, European audience, it's late at night. It'll be tomorrow morning, really, when most people get to hear this. But they're still thinking of Neil Armstrong. And I, I'm thinking maybe John uh, and Mike particularly, because you've uh, devoted so much time as explorers on Mars. Uh, when you look at these... Uh, wheel prints, uh, how do you connect those with the boot prints uh, that Neil Armstrong made uh, all those years ago? Uh, well, I, I think the analogy is, is really a terrific one because if uh, it's not in this image, but if you go back to some things uh, we've re released already, uh, you will see what I think will be an iconic image of the mission where you see the four scour marks made by the thruster impingement 
with wheel tracks that basically begin from nowhere. So you know a spacecraft sat down, uh, the rover was dropped onto the surface, and, and you see this track back to the origin. And, uh, and now what we're seeing here is the results uh, of tracks involving the, the first motions of, of, the, of the rover. Um, but I, I, I think, uh, you know, instead of a human, it's a robot pretty much doing the same thing. Next question is going to come from Todd Halverson at Florida Today. You with us, Todd? Uh, maybe we'll have to get back to Todd. He may have been, something happened. Okay, our Jane, next I'm here, can you hear me now? Oh yes, hi Todd, go ahead with your question. I, I'm sorry, I pushed the wrong button on the <laughs> telephone. Um, I, I'm wondering, uh, I'm, I'm looking at these, uh, these pictures and, and listening to Charlie Bolden's voice and and I'm wondering if somebody can talk about the significance of beaming back a human voice from another planet and and uh, you know I, I think about the times when I was a kid and I would hear voice transmissions from the moon back to earth so uh, maybe you can distinguish this as a uh, a first for uh, a planetary mission rather than a mission to the moon is, is that your point thanks yeah i think the the, the you, you hit the point exactly that this is the first time that we've had a human voice transmitted back from another planet obviously uh, in the case of uh, neil armstrong and, and his uh, famous quotes from the surface of the moon we, we do have that statement with made by a human present in the location where uh, it originated we aren't quite yet at the point where we actually will have a human present on the surface of Mars to make those first words yet, but uh, this represents the first opportunity to actually have a human voice that is transmitted back from the surface of a planet beyond our own, and, and that is really the significance that we attach to it. And we do recognize that this is a, a data file that was sent up to the rover, stored on board, and then sent back from the surface of Mars. And so although it's not quite the, the true first person representation of, of humanity's uh, contact with the surface of Mars, it, it is a small step in that regard. It's, it's an opportunity to extend the human presence uh, virtually and in some small piece out beyond our own world and have that uh, represent the eventual human mission to Mars that will be the follow-on to the robotic precursors missions that we're doing right now. All right, before we go to our next question, I understand we have yet another image and possibly a couple of images, so let's bring up the first there image. Yeah. John, do you have anything you wanted to comment on? Yeah, what, what you see there is um, uh, obviously wheel tracks crisscrossing each other. And uh, I, I believe uh, if you look to the upper left, uh, that's probably close to where the rover uh, started out. And then you see tracks angling down towards uh, where the wheels are now that are crisscrossed um, by, uh, by the tread marks. And, and the cool thing about it is actually right where they're crossing, you, you see the imprint uh, of the uh, what is now known to be Morse code for JPL, <laughs> and um, and that imprint, of course, is is used to assess wheel slip, and and that indicates one revolution around the wheel every time you th see that thing stamped on the surface, and so based on how closely compressed those marks are, gives the engineers, the mobility engineers, a, a, a chance to assess the properties of the terrain uh, in, in terms of uh, how, how how mobile the materials are. Okay, well, folks, as I said, this is live stuff coming in, so that's kind of, kind of fun today. Mount Sharp in the background. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is going to be from Space.com and Mike Wall, who's on the phone. Uh, hi, this one's probably for, for John. Could you just give a little more detail? How much time do you think you guys are going to spend at those scours doing, doing those investigations? And, yeah, when do you think that, that you might head off and might kind of make your first big drive toward the science target? Yeah, it begins tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow we do we do a bump of uh, Mike ten meters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ten meters, and then uh, Mike will be set up to acquire the second part of his data set to demonstrate the technology to use long baseline stereo with uh, uh, with the mass cams, which is going to be terrific. 
And, and then after that, uh, we start driving. And, and the ro rover engineers are really excited about this, the, the rover planners, the mobility engineers, the guys that drive the rover, and they will execute a series of increasingly long drives that will take us uh, in excess of 100 meters away from the current location, which is what we estimate to be the, the, the area that was affected by the thrusters during landing. And so we want to get out beyond that zone of influence and, uh, and head out across the plains to the east as quickly as possible. I think we maybe had another question here at JPL. Let's get a mic back to Emily here in the second row, please. Uh, this is a question for Paul. Um, I'm wondering when you do get a chance to sniff the Martian atmosphere for the first time, are you going to be able to read from that, um, res you know, results measurements instantly, or is your instrument the kind of thing where you're going to have to calibrate it for a long period before you're going to be able to say anything definitive about the composition? Yeah, we, we certainly uh, calibrated the instrument well before. Uh, we left planet Earth, and uh, we, we have some calibration gases along. So I think, uh, you know, quite rapidly we'll be able to uh, establish some of the uh, measurements that we're interested in. Uh, the major composition of the atmosphere was uh, measured by Viking, and it was optimized for a certain set of tasks, and we're, we're very interested in, in doing a double check on that. Uh, the new capability that's, you know, aside from the chromatography and looking for organics in rocks and so on, which, which uh, don't have anything to do with the atmosphere, the new capability that we bring to the atmospheric measurements really is the precision measurement of isotopes with the tunable laser spectrometer and also our search for trace methane. Um, obviously, methane's of great interest to us, us and, and many other people, uh, but uh, we're, we're going to just be very careful and look at those results and make sure we understand them very, very well uh, before uh, we start advertising something that we may not have. <laughs> so the, some of the results, I think, will, will come early and others will come a bit later. And I'm just wondering if you can be a little bit more specific about, the, um, about what caused uh, Sam to quit uh, an intake of Mars gas. Yeah, sure. Uh, so it turns out uh, we have these, these miniature pumps, we call them wide range pumps, but they're really turbo molecular pumps uh, on top of a molecular drag stage. The really nice thing about these pumps is they exhaust naturally right at Mars pressure at 10 millibar, 7 millibar. Um, and it turns out that there's a very slow leak uh, into the tunable laser spectrometer. And so there was just a little bit of residual atmosphere in there. and. Uh, in, in the Harriet cell, which is a cell where the light bounces back and forth to get a long path length for the, for the methane, the carbon dioxide, and the water measurements. And so the few tens of millibar that we had in there, I think we had 51 millibar, and uh, we had assumed that the pump would be fine evacuating that. We routinely evacuate Mars ambient out of the cell, uh, but it was just high enough that the the, the current sensor on the pump said, no, this is a little bit too high, I'm going to turn myself off, and it did. But SAM continued merrily along its measurement path, assuming that uh, we had not turned off, uh, and so we, we measured that gas with both the mass spectrometer and the tunable laser, spectrom laser spectrometer. It really led to some excitement. The, the uh, TLS team, uh, Chris and Greg, were, their eyes were wide open, they saw all this methane, and uh, <laughs> uh, it, it turns out it, it is terrestrial methane, but it, it really was kind of a good test because they saw that their spectral range was calibrated. The lines were right in the middle of this very, very narrow bandwidth area that they scan. And so in the end, they're, they're really happy. I mean, it, it's an additional piece of information that, uh, that we secured with this test. So all in all, we're not too unhappy. Okay, we're going to go back to the phones. We have a couple people who've been waiting patiently. Thank you for that. We're going to take a question from Ken Kramer of Spaceflight now. Hi, thank you, uh, Spaceflight Magazine. Uh, for Mike Malin, I have a question, please. Um, can you talk a little bit about the focusing ability of, of the cameras? How much do you have to intervene, and how much can the rover uh, focus itself at, at these close and far distances, please? The camera has uh, autofocus. Each camera has its own autofocus, except for Marty, which is fixed focus. Uh, the mass cams are autofocus. 
they can focus from, a, the MassCam 100 can focus from about 1.6 meters out to infinity. But we need to know, we needed to know the motor count of, of, facil, of, of infinity. Uh, and our initial work, we had set the, the range of where infinity ought to be to a little less than it ought, than we should have. And this, this particular test that we did in the characterization, let it go, if you will, beyond infinity. And so we got to the other side of the focus range, and then we can actually determine the, the actual focus position. And we were probably, we were about 10% off in our initial calibration information. And so, and, and the rover can do this, uh, or the, the cameras can do this, we just command it autofocus. We tend to want to give it a seed number, which is a, as close as we, we think the focus may be, and then we scan through in one direction only through that, and we hope to find the best focus, and we fit a, a curve to find the best focus from the quality of the images that we're getting during as we go through the focus position. Um, and that, uh, that's to save uh, motor counts, because these are mechanical systems, and uh, all mechanical systems in space have a finite lifetime. So we don't want to use a lot of mechanism motion to find the focuses. All right, we have time for a couple of more quick questions. Lee Reynolds from redorbit.com. Hi, guys. This question is for Paul. Um, will SAM be capable of one day giving us an idea of what this area of Mars smells like? Of what this area of Mars was filled with? It smells oh, like. smelled like. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're uh, looking for evolved sulfur compounds from rocks, and uh, you know, depending on the, most likely it's very oxidized and might be sulfur dioxide, but, but you never know. So I think that uh, certainly with the variety of, of chemicals that we hope to uh, obtain from our evolved gas measurement that may have been captured billions of years ago, I think the answer is, is certainly yes. All right, thank you. Okay, back to JPL. Um, Bill, did you have a question? Right, in the second row there. Is the, let's get the mic to him. Okay. I thought you did. I just wanted to make sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> uh, first of all, congratulations again, everyone. These are spectacular images. But I was just wondering, this question of methane is uh, a deep one. Is it isotopically different, the sample you took with you, than what you're going to be smelling for? Like you're looking for a different isotope of methane? Yes. Uh, the methane measurement, uh, even with the very, very sensitive TLS, uh, is very, very difficult because the predicts are kind of on the order of parts per billion. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there's some measurements from Mars orbit. There are some ground-based measurements, which are very difficult because you're looking through the Earth's atmosphere and have to do all sorts of correction. But nevertheless, these numbers are very, very low. Uh, they're, they're on the predictions, the observations, which we'd like to confirm uh, or not, are on the order of, of several parts per billion. And so with our direct measurements, we uh, hope to secure that answer. But the isotope measurement uh, of carbon-13 to carbon-12, for example, which is the next thing you want to do, we won't do unless we have several tens of parts per billion in the atmosphere directly. What we have long-term is a plan to really pump up the methane in the TLS using chemical separation in our gas processing system. So that's something that over a period of months we'll be testing out in our test bed at Goddard, which is a SAM, just like the one that's roving across Mars. And anything we want to do on flight SAM on Mars, we do on the test bed first to validate it. And so even if we only have a few parts per billion, we'll, hope, we'll be hoping eventually to get the, the isotope numbers. So can we compare that to what was possible with the instruments on Viking? Or is it yeah, orders we, of magnitude? We certainly can. And, and that's really one reason for the tunable laser spectrometer. It turns out that in the mass spectrometer, you have a hot filament and just the uh, diffusion of gases out of the hot metals tend to make just a little bit of methane. So it's, it's very, very difficult with a mass spectrometer directly at those levels unless you're using some enrichment technique. If, if it's much higher, it's no problem. We went to Jupiter with Galileo probe and found methane no problem, but it's very abundant. Uh, but at Mars, that's exactly the reason we have the tunable laser spectrometer that uh, Chris Webster and his team developed. 
Okay, and I th we have time for one final question. Leo Enright, back to Irish TV, but it, can you please keep your question really brief so we don't run over? Thanks, Jane. I appreciate this. Just uh, looking for a soundbite, really. Uh, it's, it's late at night in Europe, late at night on Mars. When it's morning in Ireland, it will be morning at Gale Crater. Mm -hmm. And I'd like somebody to be a little bit poetic and tell me, uh, for our breakfast television audience, what will morning look like on Gale Crater now that we've seen these wonderful pictures that you presented tonight? You're, you're the poet, John. Yeah. <laughs> no pressure. Um, Jesus. <laughs> We're not poets. Yeah, I, I, I think, uh, you know, the, the first light image at, at this particular place is just, it's, it's going to be inspiring. Uh, it, it's the, we've wondered about this place for years from orbit, and... Uh, and the, this image is basically looking what direction, Mike? Uh, south, south southeast, south, south, southwest. South, yeah, southwest. southwest. Um, it'll it'll look uh, shadowy and beautiful. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, everybody. Oh, I'm sorry. Did somebody? I, I was going to say just the, the the one thing maybe you could add to that, given the the first measurements from Sam, the the images that we have and the audio files that we have. This is the first time we have the sounds, the sights, and the smells of Mars. <laughs> That's good. All right, on that note, we're going to wrap up today's news conference. And a reminder that if you stay tuned, we will be replaying the visuals that you saw today. And there's lots of information and images online 24-7 at www.nasa.gov slash MSL. Thanks for joining us today. Hello, this is Charlie Bolden, NASA Administrator, speaking to you via the broadcast capabilities of the Curiosity rover, which is now on the surface of Mars. Since the beginning of time, humankind's curiosity has led us to constantly seek new life, new possibilities just beyond the horizon. I want to congratulate the men and women of our NASA family, as well as our commercial and government partners around the world for taking us a step beyond to Mars. This is an extraordinary achievement. Landing a rover on Mars is not easy. Others have tried. Only America has fully succeeded. The investment we are making, the knowledge we hope to gain from our observation and analysis of Gale Crater, will tell us much about the possibility of life on Mars, as well as the past and future possibilities of our own planet. Curiosity will bring benefits to Earth and inspire a new generation of scientists and explorers as it prepares the way for a human mission in the not-too-distant future. Thank you.